All right, welcome to the 38th episode of Tokyo Alumni Podcast. Today is our first international school couple guest. It's not our first time to have two guests, but it's the first time to have a couple. Uh, we have Rafai Eddy and Mika Eddy, uh, formerly known as Mika Wang. They both graduated ASIJ in 2007. Uh, we'll start with Rafai's bio. Uh, he majored in international business at the University of San Francisco and was a Division I intercollegiate athlete on the men's soccer team. Rafai currently lives in LA and works as an AR VR product designer, specializing in mixed reality experiences and solutions. He also plays for LA 10 FC, a semi-pro soccer club owned by Alessandro Del Piero. Mika was born in LA, raised in Tokyo, also graduated in 2007 from ASIJ. She attended Stanford University where she majored in human biology and minored in modern languages, where she also conducted autism research and taught a course on neurobiology of relaxation. Mika has worked in healthcare and life sciences for nearly 10 years and is passionate about leveraging technology to improve access and delivery of care. She is currently the Director of Clinical Product Innovations at United Healthcare and was previously a Fulbright Research Fellow based in Xi'an, China. They're expecting their first child and have most recently been working on Adalu Baby, a brand of educational products and services for mixed kids. Welcome to the podcast, guys. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Super excited to be here. Good to see you, Nikki. Yeah, good to see you guys. Uh, good to see your dog, too, who's joined us. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> today, uh, what we're going to start with sort of interview as a couple, and then we're going to focus a bit on Rafai, and then we're going to focus a bit on Mika. You guys are the first international school graduate couple on the show. I want to get into that. I'm curious, being an international graduate myself, like what are the challenges being both international school educated and graduates from ASIJ? as well as what are sort of the advantages you have both being graduates from international schools? I can, yeah, yeah I, I can talk <laughs> first maybe about the advantages. I don't think any big challenges come to mind immediately, but, you know, in terms of advantages, I think from the perspective of having a relationship with someone else from an international school background, because we both grew up um, in kind of a multicultural environment i think that's sort of set the course for you know our our life path and where we want to live and where now we want to raise our child and children in the future and i think just having that common background is is really helpful for you know carrying kind of a, a similar perspective especially with with the political climate and everything going on currently i think having multidisciplinary perspective and different experiences around the world really help to to handle and, and manage, um, digest what's, what's happening in the world today. <laughs> so I don't know, any, any challenges? Uh, it's, it's really hard for me to think of challenges. I mean, definitely many advantages. I would agree with you. We started um, driving later. You did. So our insurance was oh, higher. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's a, that's a challenge. Um, <laughs> obviously n none of us had licenses driver's licenses in high school. So once we came here, uh, when I first got my car, I think my, yeah, my insurance was, was so expensive. Yeah, I, I think right. I was, I think I was paying as much as, as a rent for, for insurance. But um, no, I, I don't know. I guess one of the challenges is that like, we can never really uh, agree on a place to settle really. I mean, we've lived here for a while, but we're always talking about moving and where should we, you know, kind or of like where the best place is to raise a multicultural child yeah yeah which there isn't really one place so we're we're always discussing that you guys kind of read my mind that was actually like my next question was um you know i was thinking about this before i was interviewing you guys just sort of out of my inner circle of friends um i'm not sure if you're familiar with any of these couples but there was brian hetrick and isla palmer mm -hmm. Both mm -hmm. ASIJ graduates, 2005. They're in the Gold Coast, Australia. There's Gen Belcher and Maya. Maya graduated, I want to say St. Moore. St. Moore, why? It's probably St. Moore. They're in Tokyo. Then there's mm -hmm. Erica McIntyre and Darren Brinley. I think Darren is right. about a year younger than you guys. Uh, they're in New York. So <laughs> Australia, New York, Tokyo. So um, with those conversations you guys have, have you sort of been able to narrow down like which cities seem ideal? No, <laughs> I don't think so. Um, I know. think all of the cities, though. I don't know where. I think Isla and Pakumi are in like Melbourne or something, right? Or Sydney. I don't know. But they're all international, 
really, you know, I mean, New York, obviously, LA is, is very international. Tokyo too. Um, yeah. I think that's definitely one thing that we have in common. Like we always, we're always talking about cities and we're always talking about cities internationally. Like where is it that we can go and give the most exposure to different cultures and different languages um, so that our, our uh, kids, I mean, and, and ourselves can like kind of practice uh, other languages and, and, and also like I'm, I'm pretty interested in polishing my Japanese. <laughs> I've been so out of touch with that, but. Um, so it's, it's still quite, quite up, up in the air, huh? Where, where is the next destination and whatnot? Okay, home is where the heart is. <laughs> I mean, I think it's just where that's like ultimately at the end of the day, it's like where you create and develop your friendships and establish your network and build kind of a multicultural community. I think you can do it, you know, anywhere. It just takes more effort if you're in more of a, if you're in rural America or if you're in kind of a more suburban area. So that's why we're drawn to the international cities. But, but yeah, you just have to put in the effort to really retain that and bring in the different cultures that are important to you. Yeah, and, and for now, you know, I'd just add to that, like, I think we found a really convenient location here um, in in Los Angeles, like it's on the coast, uh, you know, so very easy for my parents who still live in Japan get to. And then um, Mika's parents both live here, only about an hour away from us. So yeah, so I, I'd just say like, we're in a pretty com- convenient location here and you know, it's worked out for us now, but mm-hmm. yeah, we'll LA is great. Us. So more international people should come here. <laughs> yeah, yeah LA, LA is definitely quite the, the melting pot, um, especially compared to, I guess, as you said, most parts of the U.S. Yeah. Maybe you don't quite have that international flair that places like uh, New York and Tokyo offer. I'm not sure if I'm saying this right. Adalu Baby, a brand yeah. of educational products and services for mixed kids. So, um, what type of products um, are you guys? developing at the moment yeah so adalu rafai actually found the name i guess it means mixed in yoruba which is a nigerian language and we just honestly it was just kind of a side project that's trying to fulfill a need we were thinking about we've had so many friends lately and especially mixed friends who have had children have had babies and we realized there was kind of a gap in the market for gifts that celebrate and promote a sense of belonging among children of mixed cultures and um, help to solidify and instill pride in, in the kid with their mixed identity. So we just started with that sort of idea or, or pain point and thought it'd be cool to start developing different products and services that have an educational bent, but also celebrate different cultures and bring in different languages as well, especially because like for us, our child will be Trinidadian, Chinese, Japanese, and white (laughs) European. So we thought, you know, like even lullabies and like Rafai doesn't, isn't familiar with lullabies in Trinidadian. I don't really know any in Chinese. And yet that's a big part of our you know, respective heritages. So how do we kind of, and a lot of people are like that. They may not speak, you know, their, the language that their parents do or their grandparents do. And so how do you continue to um, celebrate those cultures without forgetting them? Like, I, you know, I guess for, for me, like a lot of, uh, a lot of my friends here, even like Japanese background, like I, I, have, a, I have a lot of friends who are Uh, Japanese by blood, but they grew up here um, and they, you know, speak some Japanese, but they really, they aren't so in touch uh, with that Japanese uh, heritage or, you know, culture in general. And, you know, I just see that as um, a pain point, uh, really. There, There are just so many people here from different cultures and they grow up American, really, and, um, and they, they want to know more about the history of their cultures, uh, where their parents come from. It's like, how do we come up with some kind of um, product or educational platform that can uh, encourage parents to u- use these like lullabies or whatever it is to educate their kids from an early stage? Uh, so yeah. we're, we're still kind of like exploring um, what those We're ideas are. But. Yeah. Starting with like different baby items, like onesies or blankets or other, you know, stuffed animals that you can like have a QR code and scan them and then play a lullaby in different languages or different icons from the culture, like embedded into the blanket or onto the onesie so that a kid's, you know, heritage can be 
displayed, worn with pride. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that's incredibly interesting, especially with you guys bringing in four, and not one or two, but four cultures. And when it comes to language, uh, Mika, you were saying earlier, your, your Chinese maybe isn't as polished as you know you, you hope it was, but you, you were in China for a bit for work uh, as a Fulbright. And uh, we'll get into that a bit later when it's just interviewing you. But I was wondering with you and your linguistic journey, as well as identity, having sort of that English, as well as learning Japanese and Chinese, like how are you able to navigate not two, but three languages as well as cultures? Yeah. Um, so I think for me, when I started studying China Mandarin in college and then living there as a Fulbright scholar and going back and forth between Japan and China that year, I think like a couple of times if I came to visit and stopped in Tokyo to spend time with his family and I would go over to, to Tokyo to meet to meet him and that was when I realized how tough it is to switch back and forth it was like what I was learning and really immersed in in Mandarin kind of 24 7 but otherwise I think you know obviously it helps to have especially the written education of, of having studied Japanese pretty much my whole life and then now you know not really getting to use it um, on a regular basis, but still remembering, like I can still read kanji and that helped a lot with Mandarin as well. I think they kind of supplement, but yeah, it did because it was my second and then third really language, I think it's stored in like a different area in your brain too. And so it's harder to like toggle between, at least it was for me, but. And Rafai, in your case, um, more than language, I think you guys touched upon a great point that often culture goes beyond language, right? It could just be something as like, you know, lullaby that you know, your parents said to you or, cute, you know, the food you eat. You have this Trinidadian, am I saying that right? Trinidadian, right? Yeah. Yep. Trinidadian. Not a very large country. In fact, you're the only person, well, you, your brother, and your dad, so three people I know from that country. It doesn't really count though. I guess it's really one family, right? So uh, one and um, I've always been interested when people come from small, smaller countries, did you feel sort of like a tighter knit circle whenever you, you were exposed to that culture? And when you were in Japan, like how, how did that culture stay alive in your family? Uh, it's very hard to take uh, that culture out of my dad. So it was, uh, it was alive and well in our household. Definitely like he still cooks a lot of um, Trinidadian cuisines. One of them is uh, something called Kalaloo, which is, like this stew that's made from like spinach and okra and all these kind of green vegetables that are blended together. Um, it's delicious. It's, it is really good. Okra. Yeah. And, you know, with like crab meat and stuff like that. And like, just like, yeah, different stews, different curries and all that, that he makes excellently. You've also heard my dad speak, like he can't get rid of his very unique accent, no matter how much he tries. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but yeah, to answer your question about the tight, knit kind of community there. Yeah, certainly. Whenever I go back to Trinidad, I feel like, you know, my dad, especially when I'm there with my dad, he like knows almost like half the island or something. Um, all, all the family members, like distant cousins, um, reach out, you know, we go and see them. I stay with them. They take me to like parties all through the night. It's, it's, a, it's really like a wonderful experience. And I, I recommend people to go there for carnival. That's really cool. Yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> I, that, that, that great time. <laughs> the car, car, is that? I mean, is that the same type of car, carnival that you know we we see like in Brazil and stuff? Is the same concept? Is people dancing? Yeah, I think, I think it's similar. Um, I've never been a carnival in in Brazil, but um, yeah, it's like it's a it's a whole process about two to three weeks long everyone from all around the world comes to Trinidad, just have a great time. <laughs> so you highly recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> it. It sounds very exciting, but also it sounds very exhausting. Yeah, I would recommend to go with someone that knows Trinidad, but it's like a bucket list so thing. So either stay on <laughs> for my <laughs> right, or so <laughs> <laughs> or my dad. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I mean, most of the people in the community, it's just three people they'll go to. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right, so part two of this interview is is just Rafai, and part three will be just Mika. So part two, um, we have Rafai, 
on on his own. And my first question has to do with growing up being a mixed child. And obviously, that's a lot of students, right, in the international school community. But I think you have a much different sort of nuanced, just a different experience because, you know, a lot of the kids we know are half white, half Asian, right, like, um, like I am. But in your case, you know, you're, you're mixed with Trinidad and Japanese. And you also have the experience of going to Yochien in Japan, most elementary school, Santa Maria, and then um, the rest of elementary, middle, high at ASIJ. So it's sort of a two-part question. What was it like growing up being a mixed kid in Tokyo? And what was it also being your experience being mixed in um, international schools? Uh, being half black, where most kids who were mixed were half white. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and I think my experience was really different between between the two. Kind of like so, in the beginning, you know, until I was six, five years old, six years old, I didn't speak any English. Um, I only spoke Japanese. Um, I grew up, uh, you know, going to uh, like a daycare. Grow up like a, as an infant, basically, uh, in in Japanese daycare. And then um, I attended Hoikun, which is, you know, completely in Japanese. Then my dad would speak to me in Japanese at home. So I would understand, or sorry, in, in English at home. So I would understand English, but I could never respond um, in English. I would respond in Japanese. Yeah, I, I'd say, you know, early on, <laughs> it was challenging. Like I was the only like mixed race person in all of my all of my, you know, classes in in Hoikun or even in, you know, like the the infant daycare, even when they make like they, I have a I have a picture of this at home, but it's like a little, uh, like a class um, piece of art thing that they made, and everyone's faces on it, but it's all kind of like cut out in this um, in paper, and I'm the only one that's like a black piece of paper that's on that's on the uh, on the thing, and you know it. it I definitely remember feeling extremely isolated. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I also used to go to uh, Japanese like summer schools when I was younger. And I remember being pretty severely bullied uh, mm. in those places, uh, you know, physically bullied, um, even in front of a lot of teachers uh, there. And uh, no one really stopped it. So, uh yeah, I, I would say, you know, at that time it was hard, but, but um, my experience really changed, I think, when I started going to Santa Maria and everyone was international, just people from all kinds of different cultures, right? Like Santa Maria has people from Bolivia, you know, I, you, you definitely know many people, but, um, you know, all over the world, really, Southeast mm -hmm. Asian, American, European, all, all over the world. And so there I felt a lot more included Mm -hmm. um, you know, so many different levels of uh, Japanese, different levels of English. <laughs> so, you know, you never really felt like you were an outsider, I feel. Yeah. Um, you were saying, you know, the, the, these acts of bullying and whatnot were done quite overtly. When, when these things happen, teachers aren't doing anything. Um, did you ever talk to your parents about it? Like, was it was it you who initiated the change, or is this always part of the plan to start Yochen and then go to Santa Maria? Yeah, no, I don't. I don't know if it was always part of the plan. I should ask my parents about that uh, in more depth. But uh, no, I I did talk to my parents about it, and you know, I think my my mom was extremely protective. Uh, you know, she <laughs> she would she would go and uh, you know complain to the school, um, but I think she knew as a Japanese person uh, who, you know, married uh, a black person, that was, you know, she, she's always kind of gone against the grain. And I think she, she knew uh, through that experience, like how, how Japanese culture is not necessarily the most open culture. <laughs> They're not necessarily embracing of, of other, of, you know, foreigners. So uh, I think that's when they, they made the decision that I should go to an international school. Yeah, I'm, I'm very thankful uh, to them for putting me through that experience because it, it, mm. really, it was really great for me. And of course, I, I met my wife there and just, you know, friends that I've, uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll have for the rest of my life. So. And when you were younger, um, you were part of Johnny's Junior. I guess in Japanese, it'd be Johnny's Junior. 
And uh, I just, I, we have actually never spoken about this. I, I've seen videos of, uh, of, of you and your brother. So um, how did you guys get involved? And I, I know at some point you guys were kind of the next big thing, right? Like they were putting you towards the front and then you guys just sort of exited, right? You, you sort of left the scene. So I'm curious what started and what prompted you guys to leave? Yeah, that's a, a bizarre experience and <laughs> pretty interesting. Um, so what started it? Well, so I think we were in, I was, I think I, I, think I was 10. So I'm like fourth or fifth grade. And um, Sion's two years younger. So, and we had a friend of ours, uh, he, you know, he was, he was the son of my mom's best friend through her like elementary school years. And um, he was actually like in Johnny Zhu. And he was kind of like a practice member in that group. I guess he had spoken to the boss, uh, Mr. Johnny, um, and said, hey, like, I have some international friends who, you know, I can just bring to like a practice session or whatever. So I honestly, like, w when my mom mentioned that to me, I had no idea what I was walking into. He, she kind of just like, hey, like, you should go to this thing with my friend. And I was like, okay, sure, I'm just going to hang out with this, you know, with my friend. My friend is, you know, he, he was kind of like, a, he, he was three years older. So he was always kind of like a big brother to me, right? always better at snowboarding than me. I learned a lot of my snowboarding and skiing from him. So like, in a sense, kind of like a, a mentor back then. And so whatever he did, I wanted to do. And so he took me to this practice session. And there I was, kind of, or and Seon, both of us put in there and then kind of told to dance. And we had no idea that that's what we had to do at all. <laughs> and <laughs> but we did, because like, that's what everyone was doing. Um, you know, they would kind of teach choreography in front of this huge group of kids and would just, you know, kind of copy it and do it. Johnny was actually there during that session. So I think we did like an hour of that on a Saturday, I believe. And then he immediately kind of like pulled the three of us aside and said, you know, just like spoke to us a little bit and said, hey, like you should go down the street to do a photo shoot. You know, I called, I think I called my mom and I was like, hey, like, you know, <laughs> he wanted to do a photo yeah. shoot. <laughs> and, you know, I think she was, you know, a little bit confused as well, but we did. Like, that was, that was kind of, we, we went and we did our first photo shoot there that day. And I think later that week, we were, like, in one of their editorials. It, it, it was really rapid because that was on Saturday. And then I think we got called back on Sunday for a rehearsal for that, um, for Music Decision, which is like a, a show in Japan that airs live on Friday nights. Within that first week, I was on my first show on Music the Station on Friday. And that's how it kind of just like, a very bizarre story, but um, we were lucky in a sense there because we were international, because we were, we looked different, you know, and we can speak Japanese. I believe at the time, Johnny was definitely looking to kind of uh, cultivate a, a way to get into the foreign market Mm. Uh, and maybe he saw some pot potential in us at the time. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah. And, that, <laughs> yeah, and that show you mentioned, Music Station, right? For any viewers who aren't familiar with it, I mean, we're talking about basically the TRL of Japan. I mean, yeah, everyone, <laughs> everyone watches it, so it's a pretty, pretty big deal of, of a show. And um, and you guys, as I mentioned earlier, exited sort of that scene quite early on. Uh, mm -hmm. Was there anything that specifically prompted that? Or did you guys just not find an interest in the singing, dancing and want to shift your focus towards, you know, academics and sports? Yeah, well, so, you know, so I think we were we were in Johnny's for about two years and we by the end of it. So, you know, the first year it was really kind of like a growth stage of just learning how to be in front of a camera and, you know, trying out different things, trying to sing, trying to dance you know do do some interviews here and there and things like that um in the second year i think i was you know being a little bit older than sound as well given more opportunities to kind of uh take a bigger role within the you know my group i guess and so you know a group was formed around me and you know i think i was on three oh, yeah i want to say three regular shows per week mm. uh, so, you know, so I was anywhere between three and five 
TV shows a week. And then on top of that, like in musicals on the weekends or concerts on the weekends, um, traveling to Osaka, which is kind of West Japan and even abroad to like Thailand to do some concerts and things like that. But it got really busy uh, to the point where I was, I didn't have any friends at school at, in middle school earlier on because all I would do is uh, I would leave school immediately once the bell rang at three, jump on the first train that I could catch and go downtown to rehearse and be, you know, film or whatever it is. And I wouldn't get back until maybe like nine or 10 p.m. every night. And, you know, I mean, fitting homework in at that point is just, almost impossible so <laughs> i was definitely falling behind in school as well and mm -hmm. i think you know i think my parents really made the executive decision kind of looking at where the, the direction that i was going in it was either i was going to get completely sucked up into this kind of entertainment business really be more of a japanese entertainer mm -hmm. um, either i was going to do that or um get this American education and go to an American school and, you know, for college and kind of, you know, be in this Western market and, you know, maybe something completely different from entertainment. But I think that's the, I think they saw more opportunity there, or at least they wanted me to explore it a little bit more and also just kind of have my childhood in terms of like friends. And <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So, you know, I remember being very reluctant to stop. Like in the very beginning, I, I was really sad because all my friends were there. But uh, I think, you know, I think I was over that in about a week or two. Like I was very <laughs> happy with, yeah, with the way my friends there. Yeah, that just sounds like an insane schedule, even for an adult, but for a kid, it's insane. I want to move on now to um, your collegiate soccer career. Um, so I, well, I graduated in 05, and um, so I'm quite familiar with soccer players, you know, from the late 90s up to about, you know, the early or late 2000s. And I think you were sort of the first Division I soccer player. And I remember that made a lot of noise because until then, you know, international schools aren't about sports, as we're both familiar with. They're, they're about academics, you know. But sports are never that bad, especially soccer. And mm -hmm. um, I think that really sort of opened up some eyes because until then, everyone was kind of like, okay, the level is okay, but is it really that good? But then you went to a Division One team, and I think that changed a lot. So um, a few things I wanted to converse with you about that is I think a lot of current high schoolers are curious, how do you get to that point? How did you get from international school sports to that Division I uh, stage? It, it, it was a very difficult transition for me. So first of all, in, I guess in preparation, what I had to do was um, between my junior and senior year that summer, I uh, went to both UCLA and uh, University of San Francisco, where I ended up going to. But um, I went to both of those schools to do like a, like a summer camp, basically, a, a soccer summer camp, uh, very short. And it was with both of the camps were with the actual coaches at the school. Um, so they were, they were marketed towards potential collegiate players or people, or at least high schoolers who wanted to play in college. And, um, and of course, also, <laughs> it, it made them some money. So <laughs> it was probably profitable for them. But um, that's what it was marketed towards. And so I had to go there. The UCLA one was actually really big. And there were only, I think, about three coaches looking at, like, maybe, you know, 100 to 150 kids or something. So wow. chances of, you know, shining there. And, and that was over like three days or something. So it was really like a very slim opportunity that, you know, you would, very slim chance that you would actually be seen at all. But the, the University of San Francisco one happened to be only about like, I think 15 to 20 players and both the uh, head coach and the assistant coach were there along with kind of assistant helpers from the first team. That's where I had the chance over, I think, four or five days to show because they have no idea who I am. And I think, you know, the recruitment, the college D1 recruitment process is pretty intense. Like they go and they watch high school players from club teams in America over, you know, their four year high school career. And mm. they're talking to many different D1 schools and they're paying for them to actually come, you know, first year 
um, in, in college. I had, I didn't have anything like that. Right. They, they don't know who I am. They have no reference, no coaches to vouch for me from, uh, Japan. And they have no idea how consistent I am as a player. <laughs> so, um, but I was able to, you know, within that very short amount of time, I think I was able to show that I had some talent and potential. And most of that really for me was my athleticism. I was nowhere close to being um, as skilled as a lot of these high school players who were serious soccer players in, in, in America. But I definitely had the athleticism that maybe most of them didn't even have. So they saw like a lot of the speed and just like the stamina that I brought. And they saw the opportunity to kind of cultivate me into like shape me into a player that they wanted. So they took a leap of faith of me, but they basically invited me to be a walk on at USF after yeah when I when I transitioned from high school to college. Yeah. So once you got there, I, I think you played the full four years. Uh, if I'm not mistaken. And um, what was that whole process like? I mean, I'm, I imagine the schedule must have been quite uh, grueling, especially during in season. It, it was tough. Um, I, I had never seriously played on a team before that. Like I only played really in high school, <laughs> ASIJ soccer team, ASIJ basketball and football. So yeah, when you go to a D1 college, you're almost an athlete first, really. You're considered like, you know, drop everything uh, for your sport first. Uh, mm-hmm. And you're almost like a student second, although they would say you're a student first, you're a student <laughs> Please yeah, play. I was just thinking of that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. But um, it was grueling. Uh, you know, we'd get up every morning. Um, I think we had like 5.30, 6 a.m. weights. Uh, and then you go back, hopefully get a nap in or go to class. And then you go to practice every day for about two hours uh, from like late morning, like 10, 10.30 until about noon. Um, and then you go about the rest of your day doing classes. And um, and then also as a as an as a collegiate athlete, we were uh, required to do a thing called study hall just so that they can, you know, make sure study hall is basically like, you know, we had to go to the library um, Mm -hmm. for, you know, six hours uh, every week. Very different from the regular uh, student experience. Yeah. And, you know, you can imagine like, especially freshman year, when you first go and you're out of the house, like all you want to do is really kind of you know, stay up, hang out with people, new people. And, and uh, the dorms also that you're, you're living in are extremely rowdy until the wee hours of the morning. Yeah. Uh, you know, so it's, it, it was tough to manage that schedule because a lot of the times you're, you can't go to sleep or you're staying up and, and then you have, you know, 6 a.m. duties. Yeah. <laughs> uh, doing physical things. Uh, yeah, as well. You know, so. well, what's been really nice to to see, though, is, you know, a lot of guys, um, I'm 34 now. So, you know, the guys I used to play with, you know, are in their 30s, some 40 now. And a lot of people just sort of quit, you know, they quit cold turkey when they play in college or they play high school, they quit. But in your case, uh, you're still playing LAFC 10, a team owned by Alessandro Del Piero, for those who are not familiar, Italian soccer legend. He must yeah. have had at least 50 games, I think, under Italy. I think he's got a World Cup under he, his belt. He, he, mm-hmm. And um, what is this experience like uh, playing for semi-pro now uh, in your 30s? It's been right, almost over a decade since you've hung your boots from the college game. I mean, it's, it's, it's great for me. Uh, I really found the ideal situation. So first of all, it's, it's LA 10 FC. Um, and yeah, uh, it's, it's a... It's, it's actually, it's a funny story because this team was the team that I kind of joined um, when I first moved to LA. And it wasn't, it, it wasn't even a, an official team back then. It was just kind of like a coach that I ran into um, doing pickup games. And, you know, he and I are really good friends now, but um, we kind of just played a lot and, in the park and then decided to, you know, he kind of decided to put a team together with all these random, you know, players that were sort of okay, but, you know, that he knew. And that slowly kind of attracted better players over, over, over time. And then I think one day he, oh yeah, he, that's, that's what happened. He was, he, he's, a, he's like a youth coach. He coaches little kids. 
and Alessandro's son was uh, came to his like school. So yeah. that's how we met uh, Alessandro Del Piero, and they they kind of hit it off. And so, you know, and then shortly after, Alessandro um, acquired the team, and so you know now it's a lot more official. It's officially like semi pro. And, um, uh, but for me, of course, like, you know, I'm playing now, I'm, I am 31, turning 32 later this year. So I'm already an old player. Uh, you know, most of my teammates are, I, I'm, I'm like the oldest field player on, on the team. And then most of the players are in, in their early 20s. They're very spry and, you know, very talented as well. Um, so, you know, for me, it's really fun because it's a way to kind of just stay fit and, and be competitive, which is, you know, what I love. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to go to, a, the, to the next level or anything. A lot of, a lot of these other players are. And um, yeah, for me, it's just like a, a great way to, to, to make connections and, and stay fit. So I enjoy it a lot. And Del Piero is a stand-up guy. He's, he's a great person. You know, once in a while he comes and he actually coaches us, like does shooting drills and stuff wow. like that really awesome so i imagine he's still pretty skilled too probably he takes a few shots yeah I'm, I'm sure he is we haven't actually played uh, you know <laughs> but i mean yeah this guy's a he's an absolute legend so yeah you don't you don't lose that type of experience and skill you know all right so we are in the part three of this three-part interview this time just a lady of the hour, Mika. I, I want to say Mika Wang, because that's how I knew you growing up. But Mika Eddy, formerly known <laughs> as Mika Wang. And um, I want to start by asking you a question about your Fulbright experience. There's been a few international school students, even just within people I know, who've done this um, Fulbright fellowship. So um, if you could maybe explain to anyone who's interested in going this route, you know, how do you get that fellowship, very competitive program? And once you do get this fellowship, uh, what was your experience like at uh, Xi'an China? Yeah, so I think the Fulbright Fellowship, they have a couple of different programs. I think they do have one you can apply for while in undergrad, so while you're completing your studies in college. Of course, now the Trump administration is cutting the funding for the International Institute of Education, IIE, which runs these Fulbright programs. So I don't know, maybe things have changed. But um, but yeah, I applied actually after I graduated. So most people do it like a year or two out of school. And I did it like, I think I was three years out of undergrad and then went like four years um, post-grad. So I was a little bit older than some of my fellow Fulbright fellows. But yeah, so it's a year pro or a 10 month program. It's a you know, scholarship from the US government. And the mission or the goal of the program is just to increase our national collaboration. So essentially take these US citizens and put them in random places around the world and help to promote um, diplomacy and help to promote awareness and education and cross cultural collaboration. So I was in Xi'an, which is kind of is the old capital of China where the terracotta warriors are that's kind of the, the claim to fame now but it's the old old capital and so it's not too rural but it's definitely a second tier city after shanghai beijing and guangzhou and shenzhen so i was there for about 10 months and then i also did a separate program in harbin which is in northeast china for a critical language scholarship so i got to study mandarin and do an immersion program for um, four months before starting um, research component of the scholarship. Are these um, programs, the other fellows, are they all American university graduates then? Yeah, yeah. So you have to be a U.S. citizen for the Fulbright program um, or to be eligible for a scholarship. But yeah, so four-year, you know, undergrad, graduate. But you can, you can study anything, you can propose any research project. So I did one on, my proposal was to look at using WeChat as like a multidisciplinary tumor board. So like exchanging patient records over WeChat since they don't have HIPAA or any of the other like patient privacy um, mm. regulations in China. So I wanted to look at how they could use WeChat as a tool for collaboration um, to help improve like patient care but ended up doing a, a different study. And then some friends were studying like art history. And I think there was one Fulbrighter who literally just um, 
picked up random cars around China, like basically like got into strangers' cars and rode around China and then wrote a book on it. So you can wow. really do anything, like literally anything that you want to do and that they deem, you know, a use, uh, effective use of their money and That's time. Quite, it's quite liberal and um, generous, I guess, of the Fulbright to allow that creativity to, play, to yeah. take place. And yeah. going back to sort of earning this fellowship, what, uh, when you apply for it, is it like you, the same way you'd apply for a job or like college applications? You just sort of send your bio and cover letter or yeah. do they contact? Yeah, there are a couple of recommendation letters and then you do your personal statement and then you do your research statement, which is really a proposal around what your research project, um, you know, what you hope it will look like. And then you have to also get an affiliation letter from the university um, in the country that you'd like to um, study in or research in. And if they endorse you, then, you know, that, that helps your application as well. So you do the Fulbright and then, then your career has been pretty focused on this um, idea of bio and tech. You specifically mentioned leveraging technology to improve access and delivery of care. Yeah. So more like distribution of care. And yeah. So really just leveraging, you know, using technology like every day, whether it's our, the apps or wearables or devices or and then more on the life science or biotech side, like genetic testing and just new you know, advances in technology to help improve the way that people access healthcare. So whether it's how you use you know, Siri or Alexa in your home to find a doctor, book an appointment, or to live a healthier life because you now get alerts from your Fitbit um, to take you know, a couple more steps to reach your 10,000 or drink more water, take your blood glucose, for example. Um, so just how we use new, really low cost um, technology to improve access to, to care so that, that everyone can, even without a, a medical degree or without access to the best doctors, can still receive good quality, high quality care. That's it. I've seen sort of this trend the last decade of like a lot more online based sort of medical advice. And especially now with um, COVID, doctors are now having like Zoom sessions. So do you see a future where that becomes the norm? Where like, if I want to go to the doctor and you know, get my, my throat checked, I just go to the camera and go, ah, and then you know, a doctor thousands of miles away would be able to just examine me and then I can maybe get my medicine via like a package. Yeah, um, so it's definitely, I think virtual care and telehealth are having, they call it like the moment of, of telehealth and virtual care, especially during the pandemic. But I mean, ultimately, I think, you know, you won't, you can't substitute that human, you know, face to face interaction, but there is a lot that can be shifted, you know, whether it's completing your medical forms online before you get to the doctor's office, you don't have to sit around and do that over and over and over. There are a lot of like low hanging kind of more administrative burden um, reduction use cases that you can apply technology to, which I think are really interesting. And that will definitely accelerate, especially with automation and using AI and, you know, bots to, to help complete a lot of the work that doctors don't want to do and shouldn't do because they're overtrained. And so I think that it'll help, you know, complement some of that. But yeah, I think, especially in like preventative care, that's really where I see technology playing a, a bigger role in helping to do things like remote patient monitoring. So like before you're sick, you get a signal that like you might be coming down with something or you may have, you may be getting the flu because of the way that your Google search trends are looking, right? You're starting to search for symptoms. And mm. there was actually, there are some studies that show, you know, that Google can predict that someone has specific types of cancer before they even realize or before their doctor even tells them because of the search, the keywords that they're using and the searches that they're conducting. So I think that will play, you know, more and more of an important role in helping to, you know, manage and, and diagnose disease early. When it comes to cost, because that, that's probably what one of the things that intrigues me the most about American healthcare, do you foresee sort of this, you said the tele health and, you know, just healthcare being able to, I guess, doctors being able to, you know, visit patients without seeing them physically taking form more now. 
I was wondering if that would in some, ha- some way or shape or form reduce costs for patients because maybe people can now visit uh, doctors outside of the States. So are we seeing that trend happen at all yet? Because it seems like all the doctors that you, you can see online are still based in the States. So the costs seem sure. to not be as low as I thought. Yeah. I mean, that's like a whole, that's a whole separate <laughs> conversation. The inflation of healthcare, I think healthcare costs are growing like 6% or so, whereas t- typical inflation is like 3%, which is out of control. And so, yeah, a lot of these technologies like remote care monitoring or telehealth can help reduce that, um, especially if it keeps the patient out of the hospital or keeps them out of the ER, which is, you know, the most expensive staying in the ER, even for the hospital for us to give birth there, it's, you know, like $20,000, $30,000 or wow. so that mostly, you know, if you, ha- if you're insured, your payer covers, but still it's a ridiculous amount. Whereas, you know, if you do a home birth or you do something in a birthing center, that, that could be a couple of thousand dollars. So it's significant difference there. Um, and I think having access to information that may keep you out of the hospital um, or if you do a visit and you realize like, oh, I don't need to go into the ER because I have this weird rash or whatever. It's just, it's a reaction to something or it's poison ivy. I don't know. That will help to reduce the cost and the inflation. But, but yeah, I think one interesting trend is that as consumers do have more information and, and can leverage these technologies, they're becoming more empowered. And that mm-hmm. helps because they're also paying so much out of pocket for healthcare now in the US, um, they're more incentivized to actually look into like, do I need to go to the doctor? Or do I need to get expensive care? And they're questioning things more and also doing more research on their own, which helps to empower themselves as a patient and as a consumer. So I think that will help to, you know, lower, lower costs um, and, and improve quality of care just simply because things are just so out of control, kind of expensive. Yeah, yeah I wasn't aware of the 6% uh, figure, but that's uh, hopefully, they said with consumers getting more information at the tip of their fingers, um, it would be less necessity to, to spend that kind of money. And of course, yeah. as you said, that's a whole other economics conversation <laughs> in regards to artificial inflation and insurance companies and whatnot. All right, so that was our three-part interview uh, with a couple, then just for five, then just Mika. So at the end here, I like to have the guests tell us what's coming up in their lives for the next few months, the next few years. If you guys want to take it away, the mic is yours. Yeah, so I think immediately what's next is uh, this this baby. Um, so it's on the internet forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know, uh, we're... Ex- 37 we're- weeks. Yeah, so we're expecting, you know, any, any time now, but um, probably like within the next three to four weeks. Um, so, you know, right now, just doing a lot of prepping the house here, as well as, as, well as doing a lot of studying about, you know, how to take care of a newborn and um, how to be a supportive <laughs> husband. <laughs> While you're going through labor, I did not so. play games while you're driving the car. <laughs> um, yeah, so you know that's 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 like the immediate future. But you do want to go a little more into what's next after no. that? No, I think that's uh, <laughs> when we follow up with you in in a year, we'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it was it was great. Uh, first couple, right? Uh, interesting to hear from you guys. Very um, encouraging to hear to hear that pretty much apart from imp- expensive car insurance, that there are n- not really many drawbacks being this international school couple. And um, again, I appreciate you guys' this time. And uh, Mika, uh, well, I'm really both of you, but more so Mika. Um, <laughs> I wish you uh, a good good delivery. And, uh, you know, healthy baby. And um, <laughs> it, was, it was nice catching up with you guys. Yeah. It was Thank great you. talking to you, yeah. Nikki. Thanks for taking the time. I'm sorry. To- Hi, my name is Nicholas Harris, and I'm the host for the Tokyo Alumni Podcast.